further through the other place, get some more until we get them all in the back.
as a ruler at each station. Sometimes I could divide him leaping off whatever train we were on, sometimes on the wrong side, things were different in those days, dashing across the tack tracks to inspect some abandoned DMU, and frantically dashing back to the train before it set off. Anyway, as a result of that trip, we ended up working and eventually living in Inverness. In what would become a turning point in Peter's career, he spotted a vacancy for a junior transport coordinating officer with the Highland Regional Council, and he was delighted when he got the job. He immediately started studying for his Chartered Institute of Transport exams and went to his first at home conference that year. That would put him in touch with people who would ultimately become his lifelong friends and who would see him promoted to public transport coordinating roles at Tayside, Grampian, and finally, Lancashire County Council in 1985. Before the desire to put the public transport <coughs> road to rights, there was strongly within him to start the in 1989. It's how I get getting to grips with the fact that he's gone, because he was large than life and seemed indestructible. He was a charismatic and compelling person, a lifelong rebel, a revolutionary and inspirational businessman. I'm lucky to have shared a large part of my life with him, and I'm grateful to him for leaving me with three amazing people, each of whom, in their own unique way, have some characteristics of their unforgettable power. Thank you. As 
someone who, uh, at the start of uh, working with Peter at the DAS partnership, uh, used to share a bed with him on a regular basis, <laughs> um, strictly to keep the costs down for our property strict and local authority clients, I should add. Um, I probably can say that I got to know him quite well. There are so many things that I could tell you about Peter and so little time to do it in. So I thought I'd tell you about what I shall remember about the day that, that Peter died. That Sunday, um, we had agreed we needed time to talk over a whole number of issues. And Peter needed to stick to his getting fit for the North Pole uh, routine, so leaving the tire dragging behind. Um, uh, walking up a hill was uh, a useful means of, of achieving both objectives. It was a really beautiful day in the Lake District, wonderful spring day. The bleached grass, brown bracken, blue sky, fabulous contrasts, very still, the sort of feathery touch of white cirrus floating above over the ridge of High Street in the distance. We'd walked up the standard route up Long Style previously, uh, many years before, and this time we thought we'd do something different, so we agreed to walk up to Bleed Water and then contour up uh, behind, the wall behind, looking for snow patches to sort of play in and thinking about his intention to be in the Arctic. Um, be surrounded by nothing but snow quite a long way. Peter was in extremely good form and enjoying himself. Um, no problems with the arm that he'd broken in a cycling adventure. Um, and even his back, which had been painful as a result of um, <coughs> doing the tyre hauling train for the North Pole, seemed to be under control. Um, in the few hours that it took us to get so agonisingly close to the top. We variously discussed a whole range of issues. The extreme likelihood of uh, a major diplomatic incident when in his partly realised plan for cycling around the Mediterranean shore over successive Christmases, he finally reached the level in Israel board. <laughs> <laughs> The guerrilla gardening, on the way in, he passed the corner of the field, um, just off the motorway at Shap, where he planted a sapling, which he was doing each midday um, during the uh, Land End of John Road cycle. Um, we discussed why I was such a lazy ass for not going skiing with him <laughs> the next few days. Um, we talked about why the hills are so attractive um, for some people, particularly the sort of monochrome landscapes that you get, and vistas that you get, particularly when it's covered in snow. So he was also thinking about what the Arctic experience was going to be like. His exhilaration of climbing out from sheer rock onto the hard snow at the top of the Marmalato in the Dolomites, which he'd done for years previously. Um, his suggestion that my partner Barbara going to the gym meant that she was clearly <coughs> a toy boy. Um, the various offers of employment, legal and otherwise, that uh, had been made to him in the, uh, in the previous month. <laughs> and an invitation to uh, get me to drag him, or possibly the other way around, uh, up some Via Ferrata in the French Alps this summer. <laughs> I got abused for being slow, too slow and unfit. You did credit pension, Taylor. Um, <laughs> and he told me he was going to take me in hand, starting with going swimming every morning. We talked about TAS and the, the various failings he'd identified in the few days observing our progress. <laughs> um, we were all, of course, looking forward to receiving the kicking. Um, more critically, I think, was his very strongly held view expressed as robustly as you can remember Peter expressing things, that the current economic climate actually contained opportunities for consultancy and not a reason for retrenchment. 
So what shall I keep with me in Peter's memory? A very, very clear understanding of the difference between management and leadership. Why real progress can sometimes depend on what appear to be completely unreasonable demands, uh, both on self and indeed on others. Most of all, his undiluted commitment to the people that were working with him. So, for me and for my colleagues in TAS, thank you, Peter, for believing in us and to one of you, we will help to that. Peter, <coughs> a consummate consultant, his understanding of all of the aspects of public transport is encyclopedic. He knew everyone who was or had been anyone across the industry including those in the Department of Transport, for which he had an employee pass of which he was very proud. And it was long-standing and had a photo from the last century with Peter wearing a tie. <laughs> <laughs> he knew many of the security officers, having been one himself, and it seemed that he knew everybody who had ever operated a bus anywhere. And he was regularly in contact with all of them. Except, of course, for the ones he had fallen out. <laughs> 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 he was a wonderful communicator. When he discussed things, he was always able to find an analogy. Um, sometimes humorous, sometimes scandalous. And uh, these illustrated the points he wanted to make. His writing was special. <laughs> Not only his regular columns in transit, and most recently, his comprehensive demolition of the Competition Commission in passenger transport, but also his reports and the formal proposals that he put together to try to get work. Some of these proposals were almost hypnotic in the way that they read. Here is the problem that you've presented us with. This is how we're going to tackle it for you. First we'll do this, then we'll do this, we'll send you a note about what we've done, then we'll want to address this and consult the development stakeholders, then we'll look into the other, and finally we'll tie it all up into a report of recommendations. And for all of these mighty labours, this is how little we're going to charge. <laughs> <laughs> Just like the best short story you've ever read, and regularly as successful. Possibly best of all, though, was the Huntley email. <laughs> a flaming god of insult and invective, <laughs> and a message that you sometimes had to search for behind the actual work. <laughs> Most past employees have been recipients at one time or another. And once you had worked out what Peter intended and were able to accept that the insults were an attention grabber, then they were often really amusing. <laughs> Not always. <laughs> <laughs> Peter was meticulous about procedure and detail and record keeping and assiduous in research. He always prepared for meetings, he had read everything he had been sent and had usually considered the outcomes he expected to get from the meetings. He chaired our board meetings where discussions are open and occasionally passionate, involving everyone, even if you happen to be disinterested in the subject, and usually, but not always, managing to diffuse the explosions before they occur. He said to me last year, I know when you're going to lose it because your belief changes. <laughs> he was a great instructor, both directly by demonstration and indirectly by means, uh, including the aforementioned emails, and patient with the personal development of task problems, as long as he remained convinced that you were actually taking it in. Once that was set in, though, he needed to jump about with it because he would become impatient. And with some people, unfortunately, he was predisposed to be impatient. They included numbers of people usually considered to be necessary to a business like landlords and their agents, <laughs> lawyers, about whom he was especially scathing, and unfortunately a number of clients. <laughs> if you fell out with somebody, it tended to last a while, because he could be aggressive, sometimes confrontational, and not often given to compromise. You were rarely in doubt as to where you stood with Peter, because one way or other, he made it perfectly clear. 
He had strong principles, many of which are embodied in the past ethos, delicate straight, even if it may not be appreciated. Don't waste money, sometimes carried to extremes, like the sharing of the Tass dinner suit. <laughs> <laughs> which did not actually fit either Peter or John <laughs> <laughs> and was not, after it could not be found recently, deemed to be of sufficient importance for investment to be considered for replacement. <laughs> and lastly, if you make an agreement, stick to it. Because of Tass's success, Peter was continually in receipt of offers to sell and he was absolutely resolute in his determination that Tass's destiny should remain in the hands of its staff. Today, thanks to that determination, every employee is a TAS shareholder. At the beginning of February, Peter offered his assistance, part-time and unpaid, until he went to the North Pole. A great thrill to have the chance to work more closely with him again, and it was soon clear that he had thought through how he was going to motivate and energise us all. He undertook work in client meetings on one of our projects, about which I think he was really happy. And he was following a process, as John has already said, laying fear our shortcomings and giving us a good kick. Peter made clear that his assistance was temporary. We will miss him more than mere works could tell. Thank you.
Kevin, Karen, and then Dan. I'm going to give Bertrand to if Kevin can come up first, and then and Karen and Dan can follow on afterwards. That would be great. <coughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to try and sing. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to give a little bit of a appreciation of Craig's time with Go North East, if I may. Craig arrived at Go North East in April 2006 with a vision. Uh, that was a vision that he shared with the late Chris Moyes. And that vision was to turn around the declining passenger transport business in the northeast of England and make it a high quality public transport company with passenger growth. He recognised the company had lots of potential. Quality was already good, but change was needed to drive the business forward. And from that moment, he was like a man with a mission. He literally took the company by the scruff of the neck and changed everything for the better. And he did it in a way that enthused and motivated his whole team, from bus drivers, cleaners, and fitters, through to colleague directors. I recall the first day he arrived wearing a check shirt, no tie, combats and sandals, and he immediately wanted to engage with staff and be seen around the patch. And as you can imagine, the drivers quickly had things to say about him. <laughs> Some would say he was as mad as a hatter, but his unique style and behaviours were infectious. However, he always led by example and decided to conform as time went on. Wearing a tie, ditching the sandals in favour of Doc Martin shoes, comfortable with the fact that he was doing what he asked others to do. He quickly won the respect of drivers, and in fact all staff, due to his openness and his accessibility and willingness to trade and decision. He worked tirelessly to transform the business, and made sure that he visited every depot business unit on a regular basis, going so far as spending one morning a week at early morning running before beginning his normal duties. His, he based his working day on what was required, nothing less than a driver, and firmly believed in walking the tour. Last winter, with snow and freezing temperatures for a sustained period, I remember several occasions when we had to run services off early because roads were impassable. <coughs> and guess what? Pete was at the helm, in the gates of the control room throughout the night, ensuring every customer and every driver got home safely. Then Peter went home. Peter always put the customer at the heart of the business, arranging bus surgeries and surveys, Branding services with low identities, over 50 in all, including names such as The Magic Roundabout, <laughs> Red Kites, Highway, Angel, and Fab 56. He was a great ideas man, but it didn't just, he didn't just come with ideas, he created an environment where ideas could thrive. He made it harder to stop change than to get change moving, and so people could see their ideas come to fruition rapidly. The scale and speed of transition was daunting. Undoubtedly, his personal effort and commitment, leading at the front, was a huge part why people could believe. In his time at Bruno East, he supported many charities, walking, running, and cycling, and even canoeing in his efforts. Transair, the Princess Trust, the Bobby Robson Foundation, Rainbow Trust, Great North Air, Air Ambulance, and St. Cuthbert's Hospice, to name but a few. His planned expedition to the North Pole, just another event for him, caused a stir when he was seen dragging a tyre through the streets of Gator. <laughs> he certainly turned heads and had to wait. Who is this guy? Is he real? Peter calmly shrugged his shoulders in his own determined way, focusing on his goal. It was another box to tick, another objective to aspire to. Who cares? His many achievements at Go North East have been applauded by the local community and industry as a whole. And there is no doubting that one of the many outstanding legacies Peter left the bus industry he so passionately felt about is the complete transformation he achieved during his short time at Goal of East. He affected many lives, more than he realised, and all for the better. An innovator, a charismatic leader, a supporter of charities, committed and determined, the list could go on. It was an honour and a privilege to work with Peter. Above all, Peter was a lover of life and lived it to the full. He will be sadly missed by us all. I am honoured to have been invited to speak here today by Peter's family. 
Whilst I'm here primarily because of Peter's generous fundraising efforts on behalf of Translate, I also feel that I'm representing the more than 15 charities, the charities listed on the back here, um, which throughout Peter's lifetime have benefited from his selfless determination uh, to raise funds for good causes both at home and overseas. I can't say that I knew Peter particularly well. I've only been in this role for 12 months, and in that time I'd only met him twice, most recently at the CPT dinner in London. Um, I got a chance to catch up with him at the end of the night, and what really struck me was how Peter had taken the time to really understand what TransAid is about and what we were trying to do, um, and he really recognised what his support, of the, the difference that that was going to make to our organisation. As I've mentioned, throughout his lifetime, Peter undertook challenge after strenuous challenge in order to raise funds for and awareness of more than 15 different charities, including the Prince's Trust, the MS Society, the Great North Air Ambulance, and the list goes on. It is incredibly inspiring to see somebody devote so much of their time and put themselves through so much physical exertion with the sole aim of raising funds to help alleviate the suffering of others. At Transaid, we are now working to honour Peter's support for our charity with the introduction of the Peter Huntley Fundraising Award. This will be given each year to the individual who raises the most funds for Transaid for undertaking a physical challenge. I hope you will agree that this will be a fitting tribute to a man who gave so much to help others. And on behalf of all of the charities that Peter supported, thank you. My dad never taught me how to serve. <laughs> he never taught me to fish or to cheer on a winning football team. He never taught me to build a fire or to give a firm handshake or to stand up to a bully in a fist fight. I suppose that my dad wasn't like other dads. My dad never taught me to drive. That one's probably for the best. <laughs> <laughs> but he did teach me that if your collar doesn't start, the correct approach is to shout, Bastard! 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 <laughs> <laughs> he always had a special relationship with machines. <laughs> I already missed him phoning up on Saturday afternoon because his printer had broken or his internet connection had gone down. But it didn't stop him from trying. One of my fondest memories of him is of an Easter about 20 years ago, when he and I worked together to build my f first ever kit computer. And though he didn't teach me to drive, he did teach me to read a bus timetable. <laughs> and he taught me to change the right tire using a bent tablespoon. Years later, I learned that actually a tool for the thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him, but he insisted that his way was better. <laughs> he was stubborn. And that wasn't always a bad thing. His refusal to give up, to keep pushing no matter what, shows an admirable and enviable determination and focus. And it's that same stubbornness that fueled his sponsored runs, climbs, uh, swims, cycle rides, each challenge harder than the last. My dad did teach me that you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Sometimes it was hard to be his friend, and sometimes it was hard to be his family. But I'm honoured to have been able to call him my father and to call him my friend. Another thing he taught me is that you look after your family. My father was always there for me and my sisters, and it didn't matter if I disappointed him or made him proud. He always wanted to share in what was going on in our lives. He once said to me, during a tough time in my life, if there's anything that I can do, anything at all, then let me know. You know I'm no good at the emotional stuff, but I'll help in any way I can. My dad did teach me to put on a tie. But he also taught me that every time you wear a tie, you're wearing it for somebody else. And you should always know who you're wearing it for. He was a man who loved his work but who refused to be defined by something as trivial as a job title. <laughs> he was a man who needed freedom, 
The freedom to drop everything and escape to the mountains for a few days. The freedom to jump on a flight to the other side of the world, or, as we've seen, the freedom to sing and dance and not for a second care that he was useless at both. <laughs> <laughs> My dad didn't teach me how to ace a job interview or to get ahead in the rat race. Instead, he taught me that there are far more important things in life than money. He told me that success comes from making an impact in the world, from standing up alone if you have to for the things that you believe in. My dad was a man who knew that the right thing is not always the legal thing. <laughs> a man whose feats and courage seemed to transcend the boundaries of what most of us would even consider possible. We all get exactly one lifetime to make our mark on the world. But a man like my father, Peter George Huntley, shows us how that lifetime can be filled to the brim and overflow with great work and great experiences. This was a man whose dreams were too large for his head and they spilled out through his actions and touched the lives of more people than we'll ever know. He cycled around the border of Italy. He climbed up Kilimanjaro. He left an indelible mark on the face of British transport and on the mark on the hearts of his family, friends, and colleagues. He was, quite literally, ready to walk to the end of the earth for what he believed in. To all of us, he was a man who climbed a mountain so he might be able to reach the stars. And to me, he was also a friend, a teacher, and a father. I'm going to hand you back to Ken now for a few final words. And after that, as my dad would say, if he were here, you can stop fannying around and bugger off. <laughs> <laughs> what I do want to do now is I just want to read just a very short poem, just to sort of draw us back a little bit now, and then I'm going to ask those who are seated to stand, and we're going to say our final thoughts. As I look up to the skies above, the stars stretch endlessly, but somehow all those rays of light seem dimmer now to me. As I watch the morning sun appear, the shadows still don't fade, as if the brightest light of all was somehow swept away. Though I see the branches swaying and watch their dancing leaves, the echoes carry on the wind, they just don't sound the same to me. As I listen to the morning birds sing softly from afar, it seems to be a mournful tune that echoes in my heart. Another day has come again as time moves surely on, but nothing now seems quite the same to know that Peter, well, he's gone. The days and weeks and months ahead will never be the same because a treasure beyond words can never be replaced. The loss cannot be measured now, the void cannot be filled. And though someday the grief may fade, without doubt his mark will live on still. For even with my heavy heart, I know that I've been blessed for being one whose life Peter touched with one so infinite because he was one of the very, very best. Could I ask you now please to stand? So now we say goodbye to Peter as we commit this body to be cremated, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We're thankful for all the wonderful memories and the privilege of knowing Peter. Thank you, Peter, for your impact upon all of our lives, for being so special to each one of us, for the love that you gave to us, the support, the encouragement, and most of all, your friendship. We love you, Peter. We always will. We will never ever forget you. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Those who can, will you please be seated? Some more music will now come on. Thank you.
Singing a song in the 